and welcome to the uh, APTA, PTA Caucus Facebook Live. I uh, want to thank you all for joining us this evening. We hope that uh, you will enjoy our panel discussion, uh, and this is titled Changing Direction. Uh, and really, this came about uh, a number of months ago, and, and it came out of many requests from several PTAs, several PTs, but uh, this has come about, and, and, and hopefully we'll be able to give you not only some good descriptors, but also uh, some ideas on how you might take your career to the next level. I'll start off by introducing myself, which I probably should have already done, but uh, my name is David Harris. I'm the PTA Caucus Chief Delegate, uh, and I have been a, a PT assistant for almost 22 years now, which is somewhat odd to say these days, but uh, I've worked in a number of different settings, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, I'm going to start the conversation tonight with uh, introducing uh, the, the panelists here. So, uh, Simon Abraham, if you will go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Simon Abraham. I'm a physical therapy assistant. Um, I've been practicing for 17 years in the greater Chattanooga area. I'm currently working in a concierge service model, um, also in the greater Chattanooga area. Uh, worked in an outpatient setting and uh, currently I'm seeing a variety of orthopedic and sports specific clients for traditional physical therapy needs and performance and health um, implementations um, through my background as a physical therapy assistant. Gotcha, thank you, Simon. Uh, Rhonda Haley. Hey, I'm Rhonda Haley. I've been a PT assistant for 25 years. So I've got David Beat. Um, <laughs> I've worked in a variety of things as well, as David said, we'll talk about later, but uh, most of the majority of my career has been spent in the outpatient setting, and I'm currently uh, working in the workers' comp arena as a clinical specialist, and I live in the Chattanooga area as well. All right. Uh, Nicole Volick. Hi, I'm Nicole Volick. I'm from the greater Texas state um, and your PTA caucus rep for the great state of Texas. I have been a PTA caucus, a PTA assistant for 21 years. Um, and I started out in the hospital in background and then moved into home health. And then I moved, I started working with a national company and became a regional director. And then because I had children, I went back to home health. And um, now I've moved out of the PTA field. I'm what we call a geriatric care manager, which is not a case manager. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right. Thank you. All right. And let's round the panel out here with Tiffany Holt. Hello. My name is Tiffany Holt. I am a PT assistant. And I guess me and Simon are the newbies with 17 years under our belt. Um, Primarily, I worked uh, in outpatient physical therapy setting, and currently I am working more in, it's a sales type position with a home health agency. Um, I'm with the others. I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So, Nicole, you're just, you're all by yourself over there in Texas. Uh, but I look forward to this. This is, this is great. I look, I, I enjoy talking with everybody and hopefully get some good questions going. All right. Thank you. I, uh, I, I definitely appreciate the introductions, guys. And, you know, as we get into this and go through the questions, uh, we really want to encourage uh, those watching now to um, please give us feedback, comments, questions. Uh, we really just have a base of about four or five questions to, uh, to go through here. And the, the idea here is to spark conversation. Uh, as all of us know, uh, really the last couple of years and more especially 2020 was, was a difficult year. It was a difficult year for many due to the pandemic, but in, in the healthcare world, uh, it, it was oddly enough, fairly difficult for the PT assistant uh, and the PT because a lot of practice uh, settings saw uh, obviously a swift decline in business uh, and, uh, you know, patients not being able to come in uh, elective surgeries going out, and then all of a sudden you have people that are, you know, sitting on the sidelines. They're at home for the first time in 15 years, 10 years, five years. Uh, and then all of a sudden we, in our normal uh, 
uh, state of mind as human beings, we typically take everything to the worst case. We typically say, oh my God, this guy, you know, the uh, sky is falling type mentality. And so that's a part of what this conversation is about is people that have had ups and downs in their career. We, we specifically chose physical therapist assistants that had been in the field for a while and had maybe made one change, maybe made two or three different changes in their career. Uh, and, and so the questions are around that, but, but it's also to let people know that we are a significant part of the profession, but we have so much value, whether it be in the profession or elsewhere in the healthcare arena, we have so much value. Um, the, the next question here really, or the first question really is, uh, for, for all of us, and I'll answer it first, but I'll ask the question first, which is, uh, have you pursued additional degrees and or certifications? Um, uh, for myself, yes. Uh, actually, uh, I think within about two weeks of graduating from uh, PT assistant program, uh, I, I uh, jumped into massage therapy. Um, why? Basically wanted to get better with my hands. So I just kind of went down that road and started looking for that idea of what what makes you valuable? So even you know, 22 years ago, it was kind of like, okay, what makes you valuable, and what's going to add to your skill set? So I went down that road and kind of enjoyed it. But that introduced me to my real, really my first uh, clinical niche, and that was lymphedema. Uh, and that turned out to be a not only a wonderful decision from a personal standpoint and being able to kind of see. The remarkable results of that, but also from a from a uh, value stance, as far as finding value in the field and becoming something, uh, uh, basically someone that could develop a program and do different things like that. So, uh, did that first, and then uh, we were talking before uh, this this broadcast. Simon and I went through a program. Uh, 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 through Great Lakes Seminar for a Certified Integrated Manual Therapist, and we were in the last uh, last class of uh, PTAs that were able to become certified in this particular area. So I did that from a clinical side and, and, a, and a number of other things. But then, in my when I when I decided to grow up, I went went back and did a couple of business degrees uh, and 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 kind of started going more into administration management and things of that nature. So. Um, it's been a fun journey, but I, I think I say all that uh, just to say that it's still going. There's still something constant on a daily basis, uh, you know, reading uh, a lot of stuff on, on a daily basis. And it may not be enrolling in a con ed course or enrolling in a new class, but it's always picking up something different. So that's kind of been my journey on the certification education route. Uh, Simon, let's turn it over to you and tell us a little bit about yours. Yeah, um, I guess first I'll say there were a lot of influences on me um, coming out of um, the PT or the PTA program at Chat State that really helped model me. It was really a lot of mentors, really everywhere I looked. I was very fortunate. The company that I started out with had a lot of strong leadership that really did not settle for just someone to come in and clock in and clock out and go home and forget about it. So with that being said, it really led me down um, about a five-year adventure of just passionately wanting to learn as much as I possibly could about manual therapy, which took me through um, the Great Lakes seminars and um, several of their courses, going through their certification, um, went through their manual therapy certification, and then that also fed into something else I was seeing a lot more clinically, which was starting to see more on the workers' comp side. And with seeing that clientele and specifically in their work settings, that drove me even further into working towards another certification as an ergonomic assessment specialist. And finding that there was harmony with one treating the other and supplementing the other. And then as I continued to go, my original passion uh, going even into uh, PTA school um, was very much around sports. Um, and then luckily, through continued research and encouragement from my colleagues, um, it led me towards Cincinnati and Cincinnati Sports Medicine in the Sports Metrics Program, which I'm also a certified trainer through them. And then that really started to lead another direction um, as far as development and being able to integrate all of those 
programs and really understanding uh, the body mechanically, its applications on injury prevention, not only for the worker, but then also for the athlete. Um, and then as that continued to progress and with the evolution of um, my career, I guess is the best way to say it, is where I find myself now of implementing everything I've learned throughout my journey. And just like you said, you know, one ripple causes another, causes another, causes another. Um, and I'm very thankful um, that I've had those mentors around me and actually still reach out to them, um, even though, you know, I'm, I'm the I'm the, the 40 year old kid, you know, that still lives at home. So I'm still calling these people and saying, hey, what do you think about this and this? And they'll answer me. It's like, you have all the answers you need. Why are you coming to us? It's like, because I value your opinion. Um, and so I'll also say that to to anyone else that are, is looking further to advance their career. Look around you, reach out to those that you trust. Um, and sometimes even more important, those that you don't really know very well. It's a great way to start a conversation to build a relationship because you don't realize your impact on someone, um, especially when you're given the tools and learn the proper way to go about treatment and assessment. Because again, by nature with my degree, the whole purpose of my position is to help implement interventions and to help those individuals reach the outcomes that they are striving for, that they, in the first place, reached out to a professional to seek. Um, so that's a little bit about my journey. I'm currently working uh, through NASM, um, working on a, a strength and conditioning certification, a um, corrective exercise certification, and then also um, kind of the building blocks on the nutrition side as well to continue to supplement all of the other things that I'm currently doing um, in my current setting. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. All right, Rhonda, if you'll tell us a little bit about uh, any uh, certifications or any, any of the things that you've worked on in, in, the, in your history. <coughs> Ron, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Um, what I was saying is prior to becoming a PTA, I was uh, attending school for uh, business administration because basically I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But uh, once I found a PTA and pursued that, um, I was working for about a year in skilled nursing and I got laid off due, due to the Balance Budget Act of 1997. So I found myself unemployed um, and wasn't really sure what I wanted to do uh, because I couldn't find a full time job at the time. So I did go back to school thinking that I might be interested in occupational therapy, but I ended up getting uh, several different PRN jobs and that led me into outpatient. And uh, from there, I got a certification like David in lymphedema therapy. And I uh, was a lymphedema therapist for about eight years. And then I, uh, moved up into leadership roles in my outpatient physical therapy clinic and became a um, clinical director. And so from there, uh, just for me, I, instead of getting more education through schools, I got it through the continuing education process. Our company had a very good um, continuing ed program. So I was able to get an FMS certification, an LSVT certification and um, got my advanced proficiency through the APTA. So uh, a lot of orthopedic uh, courses through Great Lakes seminars and things of that nature. So um, that's what I find exciting about being a PTA. Uh, you don't have to stop learning uh, no matter how long you've been out of school. You know, there are plenty of opportunities for continuing education and um, various ways to practice. All right, thank you, Rhonda. All right, Nicole, uh, let's, hear, let's hear about your experience. Okay, well, I started off as a uh, personal trainer and I was working with a friend of mine's client. This is a such a long ago story. Um, there was a team called the Oilers out of Houston a long time ago, Oilers. 
<laughs> and uh, she left me with a football player while she went on vacation. And so I actually changed his whole routine. And I thought, oh, she's going to tell me when she gets back. And she called me up and she said, and I forget to tell you, she's a physical therapist. She said, you really need to go back to school. And I thought, no, I, I have a four-year degree. You know, never say never. Why would I want to go back? And she said, I think you'd make a great PT. You know, you did everything that I should have been doing. And he really enjoyed the program you created. And I was like, well, wow, that's, that's great. Um, and so I started looking at the school and I thought, mm, you know, and she came back to me and she said, at least go to the PTA program. I'll write you a letter. You'll have to take some prereqs. So I got into the PTA program and um, I thought that I would go into sports med, right? That was my, my love. And because teachers are so good, again, you really have to listen to what the world gives you sometimes. I was uh, at a stroke rehab clinic in Oklahoma. I was going to a PTA school in Oklahoma, not Texas. And um, the gentleman that I was seeing who had a massive stroke told me, you're going to help me stand. It's going to be my 50th wedding anniversary, and I'm going to take a couple steps to my wife. The guy was huge. Remember, I wanted to work with football players. And I thought, ah, there's no way I'm going to be able to get him out of the bed walking in a couple of weeks. We only had a couple of weeks to his anniversary. PT was really good. He was super motivated. And from then, I just have a heart for seniors. I love working with my geriatric patients. I love the families. I just love seeing them be able to do something that doctors have said, no, they're not going to be able to. Or they haven't been able to do in a long time or come to their home because they do home health and problem solve and help some, make something easier for them for their day or for their quality of life to still be able to stay at home. Um, so from that, I've also had my advanced proficiency for muscular from the PTA. I have my uh, certification for a dementia specialist. I have my LBST as well for Parkinson's. I've gotten very involved with the Alzheimer's Association, Parkinson's Association. Um, I've taken several leadership courses where I was able to incorporate the leadership styles and be able to, to hold different different positions with the Alzheimer's Association and the Parkinson's Association and get to work with their staff and then their clients. And from that, um, being in the PTA field, um, I was a regional director where I actually used to recruit buildings and train staff. So I got to do a little bit of management for about 10 years. I really enjoyed putting the team together of PT, OT, and speech and seeing that come together. Is there feedback? Where, am I getting a little feedback? No? No, you're good. You're good. good. Sound good on this end. So two years ago, I decided I would get my master's um, for science and the health for the health professional and really move into the field more of gerontology. And in the city of Houston, there is a lady owned business and they are what we called uh, elder care managers. So like case managers are nurses, but care managers can be ETAs, they can be OTs. Typically, they're nurses and social workers who are usually the care managers. Um, and the interesting part about that is you get to do so much more. So I'm already doing home health. And so sometimes people will talk to me about things I'm not able to do as a PTA. That's not in my wheelhouse. That's not part of my practice act. Um, I don't get paid for that. So as a care manager, we're hired by a client. So I don't see patients now. I see clients. And we get to problem solve a lot of things. One of the most interesting things recently was a gentleman who's Alzheimer's and we have caregivers 24 seven with him in the home. Um, and they also do his med management. We're very involved with his doctors and his family. He got raccoons. Um, so we got to find a company to get the raccoons out of the house um, and make sure that his ceiling was fixed as well. And the air conditioning because they had tore up the air conditioning. So you know, as a home health PTA, I may come in and know about the raccoons. I may see the damage that the raccoons had done to the ceiling, but there would be nothing I would do. I would just report that document. Man has raccoons, can't sleep in his room, has moved to a different room, right? And go along my 
two times a week for the four weeks treatment, focusing on standing balance. But as a care manager, I get to really problem solve, got the raccoons out, got his roof fixed. And then we actually are doing other things with him to make sure he's got his COVID vaccines. He's been to his doctors. So it's really more hands-on care um, as a care manager. So I'm really enjoying this piece now. All right. Outstanding. You you went into our next question a little bit, but but I'm going to make you go back to that. So just, uh, and, and, and I think you have a one up on all of us now. You, you found raccoons in someone's house. I, that, you're, you you got one on me. So that's awesome. All yeah, right. That sounds like a Tennessee problem, not a Texas yeah, problem. Yeah, not a Texas problem. <laughs> all right, Tiffany, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, your uh, your education journey? Yes. So coming right out of school, I went straight into an outpatient physical therapy clinic. Um, and like, just like Simon, I, the PTs that I was working with were just top notch. And I knew that I needed to be able to stay up with them. So first five years out of school was con ed, con ed, con ed, con ed, um, really concentrating on the manual therapy side of things. Um, Cause I wanted to make sure that I knew what they were doing and that they were confident in what I was doing. Um, during that, uh, all those con ed hours, um, I'm a big proponent for con ed. Uh, I have my LSVT certification, the advanced proficiency pathways, um, kinesio taping. Um, currently, I'm actually looking into the MBA program at WGU. So um, waiting to hear back from there, hopefully working towards, towards that. Um, don't have any big, you know, raccoon stories or anything like that. So, Nicole, you've got me beat on that one. Um, but just continuing, just to continue to learning. I mean, it's it's a never ending process. And even though I may not be treating right now, Con Ed is still, still very important to me because it's changing all the time and um, keeping up with the studies and making sure I'm, I'm when I do get back to patient care that I'm not going to be like walking in and being scared of not knowing what to do. All right. Awesome. Thank you. You know, one thing that I, I heard from all of you and, and, and I, I think it fits this panel, but I think it fits so many uh, physical therapists, physical therapist assistants that I've seen over the years. They're always looking for something new. They're always looking for that next step or that next best thing. And, you know, that's really the remarkable thing about this field is, is you know, it, whether it be a new treatment technique, uh, a new area of the profession, a new area of healthcare, or even just a, a new area of life, uh, I, I kind of hear that same theme over and over and over. And, and that's that's what makes this field exciting, but also what makes it something that you really don't run out of options. I think, uh, what is it? The, uh, the ceiling is what you set for yourself, right? I think that's, that's one thing that I've learned over the years that if we are going to uh, create a dilemma or an obstacle, then we're the ones that create that dilemma or obstacle. Uh, and our next question is really kind of going into change. Okay. And, and one of my mentors uh, told me many, many times over the last couple of years, uh, that, uh, you know, folks, uh, everybody really does like change. You know, you hear over over the lifespan, you hear, well, nobody likes change. Everybody hates change. No, no, everybody really does like change. They just don't like to change. So change is not the problem. It's us doing the changing. So I think if you hear anything out of this conversation, I think what you should hear is that you need to be open and willing to change, be adaptable, look for that next best thing. Uh, and, and really that this field really opens the doors for all of that. So, you know, the next question uh, is kind of what led you to change direction, right? Which is kind of what this is about. Uh, you know, we all have different reasons and it doesn't necessarily mean that you change for, you know, good or bad. It's just you changed. Uh, you know, for me, I, I think uh, when I when I was a technician, uh, back in the, the mid 90s, I was a technician. Uh, and then in the later 90s, I uh, started uh, hearing about the, uh, I guess, the Balanced Budget Act of 97 and all that fun stuff. And I saw a staff of 36 
uh, in, in a skilled care unit, a nursing home, brand new nursing home at that time, I saw a skilled care unit go from 36 uh, full-time staff members, and that's PT, OT, speech, technicians, assistants, whatever. I saw that go uh, basically December 31st of uh, 98. It was 36, uh, January 1st of 99, it was two. Uh, and what I saw were a, a, a PT assistant and an OT assistant basically managing caseloads and facilities. And I saw a PT and an OT running around to five facilities doing the avals and discharges and things like that. And what that told me before I ever got in the field was I'm going to have to constantly change to be a part of this. If you want to be, if you want to be in the lead in this profession, you're going to have to constantly change and constantly look for different paths. So that was really, uh, that was before I ever graduated. Uh, and, and you talk about an eye opener. And, and I think we face that now. You know, we see the last few years you hear of students coming out of school and having to struggle a little bit to get jobs, having to find two or three PRN jobs. I guess the, the ultimate thing here is if you are continually willing to change and continually willing to, um, I guess, broaden your scope, then you're going to be able to be not only successful, but you'll thrive in, in this field or any other. So um, that's kind of what led me to change. Uh, and that was way back then. Well, there's been five or six or seven different changes since that time. And, and I've been very blessed to, to work with a team and a company that has allowed me and my, uh, my short attention span to change uh, and, and to be able to do different things uh, without getting bored. So uh, that was a, a little bit of my journey. And, and you know, today I, I get to, uh, you know, meet new people, uh, work on building teams, work on leadership development, uh, and work on uh, opening clinics to provide physical therapy, which I think we provide the greatest asset in healthcare out there. I'm a little biased. I really <laughs> I like this field, uh, but I really think that we have the opportunity to change healthcare, change the entire spectrum if we do it right. And so, uh, going from technician in a nursing home to being able to do what I do today is all that's been because of decisions to change. So, um, Simon, we're going to leave the floor to you now. And so what kind of tell us a little bit about you and some of your changes over the years? No, absolutely. You know, it was, it was really based on goal setting, um, early on. And again, going back to having, good mentors around you that I realized that in order for me to set a goal would require for me to make changes to achieve that goal. And then once that box has been checked, then here we go again. And so it, the, the structure for me has always been set based on change specifically that my first five years coming out of, out of school, I, uh, put my head down in as many books as I possibly could, um, shadowed as many physicians, orthopedics, uh, on the orthopedic side, on the family practice side, would travel to a variety of outpatient clinics, um, hang out with the, the neurological specialist, even though that wasn't my primary focus, but I needed to learn from others. And so my first five years was a plan of, I wanna be the best possible clinician I can be. And so that went down the road of, um, one, if not two of my certifications through that time. And then once I achieved that, not necessarily that you ever achieve the goal of being a great clinician, but once I got my confidence and I saw that that body of work took me to where I wanted to go, then I set my next goal was to work through leadership. And I said, okay, here's my three-year goal that I would like to work in the leadership because I felt I could have a positive influence, not only on the patients around me, but also on the on the people that I worked with, the people that honestly, you know, you see, it, you would see your coworkers more than you would see your family at times, and it was a good bond and a good relationship. And so again, I go to the, my mentors, and they changed a little bit at that time, and I said, "Here's what I really want to do." And so then they gave me ideas of how to progress. Um, I was extremely fortunate that um, with a transfer from the first location to the second location of an outpatient clinic. Uh, the PT that was the director at that time, um, she listened to me. <laughs> and she didn't just listen to me because I was speaking, but I was able to articulate the whys. 
And I think that's extremely important for anyone that is looking to, um, I guess, make vertical change instead of a lateral change. That knowing that the next step can bring more benefit to you personally, professionally, spiritually than the last one. But very fortunate that um, that my director at that time, that she was in my life and that we were colleagues because she also had some interests and it's kind of like one of those, the, the only way you can really build a good foundation and have success in an organization is you've got to groom the next generation. And if you're just looking in the, and you're in a position that just sits in the chair, just thinks that this is only mine and everything is a threat, I think you'll find out really, really quick. Um, that's just not the way it works. If you're looking, if, if success is out there and obviously that's different from everybody. Um, and so over that three year period, um, I watched my director transition into another role and I was able to transition into her role and was able to direct an outpatient clinic. Um, and it had its, its challenges, um, specifically with that clinic. It was uh, a unique setting. Um, it was primarily inner city. It was a clinic that saw a tremendous amount of turnover of clinical staff um, since that location um, opened its doors. And um, I was at that location for seven years, and I'm proud to say that, but was also able to keep a good group of people around me um, as we all grew together into looking at why are we here, getting back to our base mission of why we're doing what we're doing and being able to grow that culture. Um, after, I think that was about three to four years of working in the leadership, um, some of my priorities were, were had adjusted a little bit more. I wanted to get a little closer to home to be, allow myself to uh, play a bigger role as, as a father. And so I was very fortunate to transition again to another clinic um, within the same company um, and was at that seven, at that setting for seven years and was able to work in my own community, which was absolutely amazing. That's, that's, that is a confidence in your ability, in my opinion, when you are not hesitant to treat your, your neighbor, your, 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 your kids, teachers, uh, the members, the pillars of that community, knowing that you're coming from a genuine place to improve their livelihoods and for whatever is ailing them. And so that was a great blessing because it humbled me as well. And it continued to drive my need to wanting to do more for those people. Um, and then, of course, as everyone has saw a big change in the last year, and so it was the, the year of the pivot, right? And so with changes with reimbursement that were coming down the line, um, which, you know, it's been on the map for an, a period of time. And so, you know, we you, you hear the whispers probably somewhere maybe early 2019 to mid-2019, and then the whispers started to become conversations, and then the conversations then start to become reality. And then right when the conversations are starting to say, okay, how can maybe we pivot internally or how can maybe we pivot within the profession? And then COVID-19 hits. And that threw everybody's rule books out the window. Um, you know, friends of mine that are in the profession for greater than 25 years were finding themselves in a position that, you know, they were no longer employed. So with that um, pivotal time in my career, I really leaned very heavily on all of the prior steps that I had taken to get me to that point in the career. Um, I remember writing the letters, handwritten letters. They still do that, everyone. Once again, uh, the phone calls, the text messages, the emails. Um, and really, it came out of a place where I was essentially thanking everybody that I've had an experience with whether it was at a colleague level or a professional level, whether it was referral sources, whether it was community members. And, you know, it really came from a genuine place of gratitude that I've really enjoyed at that time, 16 years of practice. Um, and I really appreciated their trust in me and, you know, the, the company I represented and the people that were around me and really 
I don't think if I if I never took that step, I don't know if I would be where I am now. Um, but that acknowledgement really opened up more doors than I have could have ever imagined um, from the, I would say, lateral moves in the sense of other facilities and organizations, the, the industry, the nation worldwide went on hiring freezes. So it wasn't that you could go from one outpatient place to the other. Nobody was hiring. Nobody. It didn't matter what it was, unless you were driving a FedEx truck, you were at Amazon, or bagging groceries, which I had my applications in. I'm not going to lie. You know, you've got to <laughs> eat. But because of those relationships, I was overwhelmed by the opportunities that would approach me and say, well, you know, we know you've done this for this period of time, but we see a value based on your resume and your work ethic and the person you've become and the team you've always been around. And it went from the realm of other outpatient providers. Um, it went from consulting agencies um, as, it as it pertains to um, hospitality and the entertainment industry. It went from um, workers' comp um, facilitators, third-party facilitators, it went for marketing. I mean, there was so many things and I was like, wow. And what really got me is, you know, I went down the road with a couple of those companies and I was really heavily considering it. And then I had to stop and ask myself, what am I the most passionate about? Obviously electricity, running water and food was important, right? But Aside from that, um, it was the patient care. I don't think I will ever be removed from the patient care of being a PTA. And with that occurring, um, I was very fortunate to meet up with now my colleague um, who began her own concierge service or concierge style PT service in the Chattanooga area. And honestly, it's been the biggest blessing of my life. And I don't think I would have gotten to this place in my career had it not been from the previous steps and the change that was really that I had no say so in. You don't have a say so in change, but you absolutely have a say so in the direction you take it. Um, and so I think that took about 20 minutes. So <laughs> that, that's essentially uh, where I'm at now. Um, I couldn't be more happier on the practice setting and even where, where I'm at now we're planning on continuing to evolve and change. Excellent, excellent, thank you. And before we move to uh, uh, you, Rhonda, we had a question in the chat box here that uh, was talking about, and this is from Hannah, and it's asking the question of, have your uh, advanced certifications allowed you to command higher compensation? Uh, just from my end, uh, briefly, um, I would say yes and no uh, for me. It's Yes, and the fact that those gave me a deeper understanding and a greater knowledge either of, of the skill set or of the business side of it. And, and so it wasn't necessarily that the certification or the degree uh, gave an increase in salary, but the knowledge that came with it as I progressed allowed me to, 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 to you know, garner a higher salary, a higher wage. And, and I would say that that would be uh, that, that's probably the, the biggest thing I would add to that. So Rhonda, we'll, we'll have you answer that question as well, but also uh, give us, uh, give us your why, uh, why you changed. Yeah. Um, thanks. As far as have the certifications allowed me to command a higher compensation, not necessarily, but I do believe that diversifying and becoming specialized in something helped me keep a job for a longer period of time, uh, like David being becoming LSVT certified, I do believe that made me more marketable in my position since I was the only one, you know, doing that. So it didn't necessarily give me a higher compensation, but it definitely helped me keep my job and made me a more valuable team member at the time. Um, and then to answer the question about change, um, kind of piggyback off of Simon, I, for one, don't like change. <laughs> I hate it. But I was kind of forced to change um, 
like I mentioned earlier, uh, because of, as David also mentioned, because of the Balanced Budget Act, I was one of the ones that did get laid off during that time. And I had only been out of school for a year. And for all I know, I would have still been at the skilled nursing home, you know, if I had not been laid off. So one thing that taught me is that, you know, no matter what job you're in, it's never completely safe. Um, you can always get laid off no matter what you're doing. But, you know, there's it led to more opportunities that I may not have taken if I had not gotten laid off. And so I'm really thankful for that. Um, over the, the years following that, I kind of branched out because I had to. I was kind of forced to. Um, and I started uh, working in outpatient and acute care and, and along the Along that time, I've developed new skills and it led me to meeting new people and to the job I eventually got, which was with workers comp um, in an occupational health setting. And I stayed there for about five years and then I had kids and decreased my hours and was working part time. And then when I was ready to go full time again, um, I uh, found a job uh, in outpatient and uh, that's when I started doing lymphedema therapy for uh, about eight years. And I never really thought of myself as a leader, but eventually, uh, through the encouragement of a coworker, did uh, become a clinical director. And through that, I, I think I gained confidence in myself and, you know, branched out in my skill set, learning the operational um, aspect of physical therapy and uh, some sales and marketing skills that came along with that. Um, and, you know, I'm a little older, so I, I was already kind of thinking about, you know, where am I going to be in the next 10 years? You know, am I going to physically be able to keep doing this job? And in outpatient, yeah, probably, but maybe not in skilled nursing, you know. Um, but so I was already kind of thinking along those lines of, you know, what am I going to do in the future? Um, but then, as you all know, uh, Medicare cuts were being proposed. And so that was, I knew that I was going to have to pivot in my career, that I was going to have to change because the, the clinic I was working in at the time was very small and it was a heavy Medicaid population. So I knew that I was not going to be able to stay there. Um, in that clinic. Um, so I was already looking for opportunities within my company, like at the business office. And I, I remember going to all the APTA conferences and uh, seeing all the recruiters. So I was really thinking about that. I think, you know, I would like recruiting. So I was looking into that. And um, so, as you know, with uh, COVID came and uh, my uh time at the clinic was cut even shorter than I thought it would be, uh, along with a lot of other people and got furloughed. So uh, even though I was already looking into opportunities, all of a sudden those opportunities were gone. You know, there were no jobs. So um, that was stressful, but I've, I've been through this before. Um, and I knew that something would come along eventually. So honestly, just staying positive is really helpful. Um, not giving up, um, persevering, just taking every opportunity that comes to you, you know, networking, talking to your friends, what are they doing? Um, uh, that was very helpful. Uh, so change may not be something that you are looking for, but sometimes change happens whether you're looking for it or not. So just um, being able to uh, be flexible is very helpful. Uh -huh. Good advice. Good advice. And you, you went into the next question, but I'm still going to ask you again. Oh, sorry. So, all right. So, uh, Nicole, uh, how about your journey? What kind of led you down that path of changes? Uh, and, and can you give us a couple of examples through your career that have been um, changes, but also positive changes for you? A absolutely. Should, can I answer uh, Hannah's question first? Sure. Okay. So on the certification, so I have the advanced position. Um, and I have the LBST and then I have my certification for de dementia specialist, which that one has to renew every year. 
um, and it's pretty labor intensive. It's a 16 year, 16 hour course. And so again, just like Rhonda said, I don't think that I got compensated for it, but because I hold these certifications, I was able to do certain marketing aspects for the companies I've worked for. Um, I've been invited to speak uh, through Alzheimer's Association. Um, and because I was able to also get referrals back from these things, it, it, it gave me patients to see through home health or patients to see um, during my time at the hospital as well. So not actually getting raises or getting paid because I took a certification, but because I had the certification, it created interaction for me and for the company I work for. So I think that, you know, don't hold yourself back because you're looking for compensation. Take the CCUs, take the continuing ed courses as much as you can. You keep hearing all of us. We took probably five years of our life just to learn different things through Con Ed that we were passionate about, that our companies may have a trajectory for us to follow or not to follow. So I hope that answered your question, Hannah. Um, for me, uh, starting off as you know a personal trainer and then coming into the field as a PTA, I had my own business as a personal trainer. So when I went to the hospital, I literally took my calendar out because a good home health companies want you to have a year. And I marked a year on my calendar. Um, and the coolest part was in the hospitals, the docs would let me go and watch surgeries. And so because I'd already graduated and I already had a, my degree and I was working, I still had some really good education pieces of being able to see surgeries. I saw, I don't know how many hip surgeries. I saw a ton of shoulder surgeries. I saw brain surgeries, which you're not going to really see what they're doing, but I was invited by the docs and then they would talk to me about it afterwards. So I really feel that um, I ended up spending a little over a year and a half in the hospital because I had such a good relationship with the docs that I was working with before I moved to the home health agency. I moved to the home health agency and I was working full time for a home health company that was a big one in Houston. And so I could drive everywhere. I put a lot of miles on my car. So I'm just going to talk about change here because I had students that would ride with me and I would tell them kind of like the Army, Navy, it's an adventure as a home health therapist. You don't know what you're going to get into. And every day is changing. Your schedule changes, your route changes, your patient changes. Um, you know, where they want you to go that day is definitely changing. So there's a there's a certain caliber and character trait as a home health therapist that you need to be flexible, um, not be afraid to go into some people's homes or trailer homes. Uh, like I said to students before, one day I could be in a mansion and the next day I could be in a trailer home and be very careful about where I step. I really like going to people's homes. I don't really care. I'm not better homes and gardens. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to problem solve and, and have that quality of life and engagement with my patients and their families for them to be happy where they're at and to be strong. So I love that aspect of PT and, and doing what we do as far as home health. Then I moved into working with a company called Western Group. They're in Jersey. I'm in Texas. I actually did not meet the owners for probably about three years. Um, they gave me that freedom that I really liked with the home health piece. And at the when I first started, we had one client, but we had three different buildings. Now, when I say buildings, outpatient, you're thinking outpatient clinic. We were in the side of assisted living. And so I had teams that were kind of moving and driving back and forth between these two buildings. But I also had contractors. And I realized for a profit margin, I had to let these contractors go, um, especially one time I walked in and the speech therapist had her feet up on the desk. She already saw the one patient she had, but she had a minimum of four hours a day. And I was like, you're living the good life. I said, why can't we do some screens? Can we do something? And she and I really, we kind of butted heads. So she actually ended up coming to work for us after that because I cut her off as a co contractor. I said, I'd love to hire you but I'm going to expect you to work and I'm going to expect you to be productive. And when I say productive, I said 75% was a, a good productivity. Um, I love putting our teams together, PT, OT, and speech. I love finding the buildings. I acquired 15 different clients as a regional director for my company. Then I remembered I have children. 
So I had to come home uh, to be mom, to put that other hat on. So I came back and I went back to another home health agency. Um, I was working for them for the last 10 years of my career. And, you know, we would have the highs and the lows, my caseload. Sometimes I would have 15 people for the week. Sometimes I would have three people for the week. It makes it really hard to budget your own uh, budget at home when your income is up and down like that. So I had started looking as to what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, I know that I love working with seniors. I know that I continue as long as I can work with my my senior population and their family. I didn't want to leave that realm and um, looked at University of Texas medical branch and it found the program that I went to that the masters for health professionals. And I really love that. So when I was getting ready to graduate, as we all said, we're pivoting, COVID's happening, what's going on? I mean, I'm still fortunate and I'm working for my home health agency. Um, there were a lot of our staff that didn't want to work. So believe it or not, I got very busy during COVID. I got to see patients for um, people that weren't comfortable treating. Um, I gowned up, I put my mask on, I you know, put my gloves on and uh, treated COVID patients. I've been very fortunate. I'm going to have my second shot vaccine in a few days, but my family and I have not had any COVID incidences, even though I treated a lot. I treated probably at least 15 patients I know of that had COVID. Um, and it was hard seeing that. It was hard watching my friends in the hospital. I know we all have more stories about what's going on personally with our coworkers and friends in different settings, um, seeing people get laid off, seeing, seeing the amount of people who have died this year. Um, it's just been really hard. Um, so as I got ready to create my resume, I have a friend of mine, um, wonderful lady, who had told me, you know, how old is your resume? I'm like, oh, at least 10 years old. I've been a home health company and I haven't been looking. So she educated me that Google is a really good thing and not to use the monster and all the other ones. She said, you can set your filters on Google. She said, what I want you to do is create a blank resume of what you like. And my things that kept coming up with was advocacy for seniors. Um, advocate, a, advocating for seniors for better health care, advocating for better DME, advocating um, for more resources. It just kept coming up in anything I looked at as far as my dream job. And so I created my resume and I put it out there. And within probably a week, I had a call from an elder advisory group who I'm working with for care management. And so I was thinking case management. I'm like, I'm not an RN. And they're like, no, care management is a different field. It's very much new. Um, and they said that maybe 17 years, they have their own association as well. And they're very much on the care management uh, name. And so I can become a care manager, but I have more education, two years to go through and a certification to take as well. Um, but the interesting piece of this is it keeps me with my seniors. And like I said, you know, about the raccoon story, that was just one. Um, but we all know through home health or through whatever setting you're in that you have an, an elderly person living one place. Their family members may live a different place. They may live on a different coast. They may live on a, a different continent. Um, and so when the journey of the aging part begins to happen for a loved one, you know, these hard questions come up. What will we do? Where, where will they go in the continuum of care? Will they age in place? Do they need 24-7 caregivers? Do we need to move them into independent? Do they need to move with a, you know, a family member? What's going to be the best thing? And I, I truly love getting to work at this piece. Um, I'm on day 60 with this job, and I do a lot of Zoom the family members i you know that piece we all talk about as therapists i'm not that type of therapist i'm a physical one i get to open up the door and really listen more than i never ever could before and not just listen to the client but to the background of where they've been the family and what they've gone through and how they've got to this piece and how we're going to do the end journey as gracefully 
as we can for their family member, for their mom or for their dad. Um, there's a lot of mentoring that I'm doing, a lot of mediation that I get to do now. I have a whole team of social workers and nurses that I work with and just learning that process the last two months has been so eye-opening and I can't wait to do more. Um, I, I never thought I'd be here. You know, when you when you start as your PTA journey, where you're at, like I said, I really thought I was going to be doing sports med. Now I'm senior related. I know that that's where I want to be. I never knew about this piece. So there's always more that we're always uncovering and discovering. And I just love this journey as a PTA now. Thank you, Nicole. We appreciate that. It's a, it's a great journey. Uh, Tiffany, let's, uh, let's have you give us a rundown of a couple of the changes that took place in your career. All right. I'll, I can go fast too. Um, after I gained my confidence, you know, with working in the outpatient setting, you know, I went to be a clinic director and I was a clinic director for about eight years. And I, I loved the leadership portion of everything that I did. Um, I loved learning the operations side. Um, so I've learned that that is, that role is a passion for me. And that's why I want to pursue that and go in with the MBA. Um, I'm also still big an uh, advocate for, you know, patient's voice. I worked a lot with um, the Muscular Dystrophy Association and ALS, and want, I, I still want to advocate for those patients, even though I may not be treating them right now. Um, they're still near and dear to my heart. Um, so moving on, you know, I, I, March of 2020 is when I was laid off, and I started my new job in June of 2020. And I will tell you, you know, it was hard. It hurt. But I have two two little kids at home. And this new position that I'm in um, with the sales realm has really been a good change for me. Um, I'm able to be with them a whole lot more, which has really, that's been the biggest change. And I'll say that's probably the best the best change ever, um, being able to be with my kids and not having to stress about that eight to five, eight to six job. Um, I can do what I need to when I need to. Um, my my boss is amazing and he really helps me out and he understands, you know, where we are right now with COVID and homeschooling and all that kind of fun stuff. So yeah, change is scary, um, but it can it can be for the better. And I think my change it was for the better. All right. Excellent. And, you know, guys, I think everyone has had um, obviously different experiences, different, uh, different journeys and different roads. And um, before we wrap up, we, uh, you know, I want to thank all of you uh, for, for everything, for giving your stories. And, you know, I, I think going into these type uh, events, it's kind of like, well, this may take 30 minutes. It may We won't make it to an hour. And then we get to the end and we're like, oh, man, we need some more time. So I'm going to address a few more questions here uh, that came up in the chat. And one was in regards to um, how do you see the PTA role changing um, with the next round of Medicare cuts? You know, I, I think the one thing that you'll see with physical therapy as a profession is, is, uh, and I think I heard it a couple of weeks ago on the centennial celebration, is we we were we were created in war, and we will continue to battle through and continue to uh, figure out ways to take care of people, to take care of patients, and to take care of society, regardless of the cut, regardless of what insurance does or doesn't do. I think. Uh, does the role change? I think the role needs to continually evolve. Uh, we need to continually improve our skills, improve what we're doing uh, to make ourselves valuable and to create um, not only a niche, but create something that's beneficial to society. Uh, one other question came up. Uh, this was from Tracy, and it says, with some of the challenges with insurance denials for equipment, rehab, et cetera, have you ever looked into a role in the insurance form that would allow them to see P, uh, the PT perspectives, the impact of their decisions, et cetera? Um, I think that's a, 
the ten million dollar question, Tracy. I, I haven't personally. I do know that uh, I, I've been fortunate enough to participate, and and some of them, uh, all of us on this uh, call, and and those of you watching, have had the opportunity to either participate with authorizations or insurance companies, and and see the the good and the bad. Um, I do know that uh, APTA has a lot of folks working directly with uh, payers and contractors, and 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 trying to get our side of the story out, uh, so to speak, as well as other organizations that are promoting healthcare. So I, I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I think overall it, it could happen. Uh, it's, is that what you want to do? That's what I would say. And then in closing, really um, what I've heard here is opportunity, take advantage of opportunity and never stop running. Okay. That's, that's really the message here. Uh, it's changing direction. You've heard stories of how people have changed their their careers, their lives, and and what seemingly was the worst thing in the world to ever happen turned out to be the one of the best things in the world to happen. So, uh, I would I would leave you with this. Uh, uh, you know, encourage you to continue to reach out to those colleagues to find a mentor, and never leave mentors. Always, always, always look for people to help you get better at what you do, regardless of what you're doing. So I want to thank you guys for a great conversation. Uh, I wish we had more time, but we are over right now. So thank you so much, guys. We appreciate every, every 